Isthmus of Panama. I present David Seitz and Alex Reyes. Jordan and Shorty and Slim. The earliest memories I have of Shorty and Slim. Alex came over one night and we spent the whole night. We literally stayed up all night. He played songs that he wrote. I played songs I wrote. We never sat down and played guitar that way before. We had been part of a church youth group and we played songs for that. But we never played our own stuff. And so after that is when we decided, you know, we, we have quite a bit of things. We can make this work and maybe we should make an album. Well, we made a tape back in the day. That took off. That started short and slim. David and Myra were living in a high-rise apartment in El Dorado, and they lived on the top floor. And I would go over there and spend the night. So we'd have dinner, and then David and I would go upstairs. They had like a little spiral staircase up to an attic and we would sit up there and put albums on and try to learn leads or we'd play duo songs and sing together and that was really where the shorty and slim sound was starting to happen i had songs that i'd written in college david had like a big folder like this of songs that he had written in college and we picked the best ones and we focused on those and we did that that first like the first real life on mango street album with those i think there was i don't know 15 songs on that album. Because my name is Pedro Palin now. Hey, push my car in the midday sun. Listen now, I have a story to tell. Sweat on my brow, ringing my bell. Sweat on my brow, ringing my bell. Shorty and Slim uh, started out in 1992 when Dave and I were just jamming out in Gamboa. We made our first tape on a little four track recorder and we had to kick the kids out of the house. Uh, we, had to, we had to turn off all the air conditioners and, it, and then you still hear the kids upstairs. Ah, do it again! Well then people started hearing the tapes and the cars and stuff that we were playing and like, we want a copy. So at night then I was burning one, two, three, five, fifty tapes a night. Then we decided to take it another level, took it to a studio. We had no studio experience. We did that in Musicalia studio on Transismica. That was with Jose Mosquera, La Mosca. I remember going in there, we had no idea what we were doing. And the coolest thing about that first experience was one, one day we came in, Jose was all like bug eyed and he's like, uh, I'm like, what's up man, what, what happened? He says, well last night we were recording Nando Boom all night. And that's when I went, wait a minute, this is a different world. We're, we're in the same studio with Nando Boom. Chuleta, we better, we better tighten things up because this is the real deal. And down the street we would run and race. 20 cents in your hand. You better bring it, everybody sing it. I think our first gig was we played in front of our house in Gamboa overlooking the field and there was no one in the field, just us playing. I think we have a picture of it. We're lined up there on a the concrete with the field in front of us and just playing to an empty field all our new songs. And if I do it back, I won't miss a beat. We were gonna name us like tall and short or thin and trim, but short and slim won out. And really we wouldn't have a short and slim without slim. He has no inhibitions when he's on stage. He's a great performer. He can just turn it on any given time and become short and slim. It's, it's amazing to watch him. He has a great stage presence. I would rather be out watching him than up there next to him playing. It is fun to play, but it's fun to watch him. A lot of times you'll see me 
I'm just staring at him, watching what he's doing. Maybe you think I'm lost or something. I don't know what's going on, but I, I just want to see what antics he's up to today, because you never know. Well, the first time I remember I ever met Dave was sometime around the time that he married Myra. I must have been 11, 13 years old or something. And I knew that David was a great guitar player and a great leader. And the thing I got to know as I got to know David better and in a more intimate way and in a more songwriting way, I was amazed at how great his lyrics were to capture a feeling or to capture a moment or to capture a scene. I learned a different way to songwrite in a very profound way. I think all of David's songs like mine, Leaves of Green, My Life, all these songs, if you just sit down and listen to them, they really have a profound message that they're trying to send, you know, and it's pretty consistent through all the way through David. And I think it comes from life experiences with David, but he's also a very introverted person. He's always thinking about stuff. There's some stuff going on under there all the time that, that really lends to really, really good songwriting. Now, when we're a one-on-one -on -one and we're just talking and yickety yakking, you never know what's going to happen because he's a very, very comical guy. So he's a, a good partner to bounce stuff off of. Dave, he's an amazing guitar player. When, you, when you're in the studio, he'll hit the leads. And then we get on stage, and he's got the lead down. The problem is, in a shorty and slim gig, you never know when the lead's gonna happen. And it usually happens like this. Shorty, go! And it could be any time in the song. It could be in the intro, it could be after the second verse. It changes all the time. That's the thing about when you're playing in a shorty and slim band. You gotta be ready. You gotta be watching, you gotta be ready. So Dave is like, you, the lead's not there. It's the next measure, man. So I love to look over and go, shorty on the guitar. And he looks at me like, do you need or not? No. Rash charging. Roland's the same thing too, I like to say. I like to do in the middle of the song, go, ladies and gentlemen, Roland Fultz. And then look over, Roland's like. Is that what you wanted? Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Roland Fultz. Roland playing bass. He's one of the best bass players I've ever heard. Uh, we're blessed to have him in the band. He can, he can play it. He practices. You can tell because the stuff he's throwing in there. He doesn't do just one little simple note. If you listen to the album and the way I wrote the bass part, and then the way he plays it, it's it's a whole nother level. It's really good. Love having him in the band. So after that first album, we decided, let's do another one, Shardy. We had enough songs, so we did one in 97. It was called Gone Platano. And we worked a lot with Jim Hashman on that one, uh, doing a lot of pre-MIDI recording to produce that album. And then we went to Balito Chan's studio. And Balito was really excited about Calypso, because he had recorded Calypso artists um, from back in the day. So he's like, wow, I haven't had a Calypso artist come through in a very long time. That was a really good experience in a monster studio. And Evan Rodnici came in and did some cameos. And a lot of it was pre-recorded MIDI, so we just went in and went bloop and downloaded tracks, and it was fast. <laughs> we were in a hurry to do third one, and we contacted Evan Rodnici, and he was just starting his master blaster studio. And he's like, let's go, let's go, let's go. We can record. We got together in a house in Corozal with Evan Rodnici, in a bedroom that I can been converted into a sound studio to record. And um, the first song that we did was The Old Days, and it was really awesome to sing with Vivian and Allison Smith. 
um, and also Myra, and we kind of created our own background vocals on that, which was really fun to collaborate with them on that. David was moving to Germany, so we crammed that album in there at night. Uh, I would drive back from Cologne and we'd do those that recording there. That was fun, fun, fun because we got all our kids in that in that album. That was the first time that we decided let's put our kids in there. And they're old enough; they can carry a tune, or they're fun. And my my one-year-old daughter was in that one too, laying on the floor, tickling her so she could come out on one of the songs, laughing. That was turd one. Thank you, Evan. <laughs> Omar joined the band around 1996, I think. Alex was working driving piles, some pier, and Omar was a barge rigger at the time. Y bueno, empecé a trabajar en con, con contratista, Dillon Construction, Intercostal Marine, y en ese vaivén conocí al señor Alex Rey, ingeniero civil. Bueno, trabajamos en Colón 2000, en Evergreen, viajamos a Nicaragua, bueno, fuimos para todos lados, hasta que él descubre que yo siempre estaba con los coolers y mis compañeros de trabajo, Music. He'd line up some coolers, a couple of garbage cans flipped upside down and set up his congas and just play rhythms. Slim. Black Van Halen, Black Zeppelin, Grand Fond. Y ahora está tocando esa música que me criticaban. Yo, hey, me siento bien aquí. Ahora esos señores reconocen que fue mi mejor elección porque este grupo es música original y música que habla de Panamá desde los principios de la construcción del canal la tradición y la cultura de Panamá claro que sí yo le meto mano a toda esa música que me gusta a mí pero esto que estamos haciendo ahora no es cover es música de nosotros Omar's been playing drums probably for 50 years. He, he used to play in rock and roll bands in the late 60s and 70s. Uh, he's, he's amazing. He's technically right on all the time. And we can play for four hours, six hours, and he's still playing. Even though his hands are beat to pulp, I don't know how he does it. Bueno, soy el tecladista actual del grupo Shorty and Slim, celebrando los 25 aniversarios de, del grupo, aunque yo nada más tengo 19 años en el grupo. Pero igual, ahí estoy. Ruben's another guy that we met in the church choir. He was playing with Tito Moines. Así que este conocí a Ale Reyes, estábamos en la iglesia, y yo tocaba en el, el órgano. Ruben was putting beats to the Our Father, so it was like Our Father, and I was like, wait a minute, this guy, this guy needs to go and join Shorty and Slim. He was playing beats. I think the Archdiocese had to come in and like write a letter like, Dear St. Mary's, you can't be putting our father to beats and scratching. It was so funny. Y él se me acercó un día, hey, ¿quieres venir una práctica mía que no sé qué con el grupo Chorchecillo? Dale, dale, yo puedo, no hay problema, vamos. 
Bueno, dale, mañana platicamos en la casa de Roland Ford, el bajista, el bajista. Y allá entonces conocí a Roland, a Omar. Ale, porque David no estaba en Panamá, ya David estaba fuera del país. Ruben can play bass with his left hand on the keyboard and he can play keyboards on the right hand. He can play drums on the keyboard better than most drummers can drum. He's got two separate brains and he's an amazing keyboard player. So Dave moved. Dave and Myra and their whole family moved in 99 and we kept we kept keeping in contact through email. Social media wasn't a thing yet, but we thought, we're, we're probably not going to make an album again because you're too far away and this and that. Um, but he wrote some songs and I wrote some songs and we decided let's do one more. And David, David came up with the name Going Down to Panama. So we produced that album. At the time, the studio was called SMB3 with Eddie Bolsano, Mario Spinali. That was uh, Daniel Mediano and Pam Clark was in there too. SMB3 studio in, in a, in a high-rise apartment in, in Punta Pacifica. And that was, by that time our music was changing and then we were working with these producers that were actually, instead of just pressing record, they were helping us to write songs, to arrange, to add um, new sounds to the songs and even uh, make them more contemporary. That was one of the, that's probably one of my favorite albums, that whole going down to Panama uh, album with SMB3 which I think now they're called Trilogy, Trilogy Studios, and those guys are amazing. So as a band, we really don't hang out much. Like I lived in overseas in Europe for so long, and they were in Panama. So when we went there for either a week, maybe two weeks, so we'd play a gig, at least one, maybe two, we'd see them at practice. It was a rare occasion that we got to hang out together. But it was always fun when we did. So we played some gigs in Jacksonville, Florida, where we got to spend three or four days together, and they were a blast. I asked Alex and Dave, would you come up to the United States in Jacksonville and sing to these Americans and play your music? And they said they would, they would love to. So Dave came in from Germany, Alex came up from Albrook where he lives, and all the other band members, and, and even Dave's daughters came, they're wonderful singers, and they played for everyone. Before they came, though, they decided and to surprise me, and Alex wrote the words to a song called Never Quit. And they wrote this back eight years ago. And it was just fabulous. When Eric invited us to play here in 2011, we thought it would be a great idea to write a song about the great message of Never Quit, about putting your body to the test and your mind to the ultimate challenge and to never quit and persevere. We played at the start line before everyone takes off running. It's very, very touching, and it applies to all aspects of life, whether you're from the canal zone or not. It's just, there's nothing like it. The Jacksonville gigs were great with Eric Petroni and the never quit, the never quit message. That was where I started to realize, hey, we could have a message behind our music and not just a party. This is a real message. This was about living well, making good choices about what you eat and working out and keeping in shape. And But those gigs were on another level when we had sound guys, we had sound checks. We're like, whoa, never, I had not done a sound check before. And there's a guy out in the front doing a sound check. And there's a guy on the stage doing a sound check for the monitors. And we, you know, sound checks probably took twice as long for us because we didn't know what we were doing. And by, the, by our third gig, we knew what we were doing by then, but I remember one time I broke a string, which happens a lot in any gig. I broke a string, so I took my guitar off and I went backstage, and one of the techs grabbed the guitar and he started doing everything. I'm like, hey, I can handle this. He's like, dude, don't worry. This is what we do. So that's where I realized, oh, this is how like the, move, the big stars do it. They just hand their guitar off and get handed another one. I grabbed it, I'm like, whoa, let me tune it up. He's like, tune it up, bro, that thing is tuned, man. I put it on, I was like, whoa, and we're back then. About 15 years ago, we started a band in Germany with an old Canal Zone guy, uh, Darren Riggs. And he was living in Frankfurt, and I don't know how we got in touch, but he was in a little band, and they needed more people, so I played bass, and Myra played keyboards. 
and we learned about 60 songs in about three weeks, and it was fun. And the whole time we're playing together, Dave is telling me about Shorty and Slim, and I quickly fell in love with the music of Shorty and Slim. In 2007, Dave reached out to me and said, hey, you're coming to the reunion this year. Why don't you play with Shorty and Slim? Play bass for us, because we're going to be performing there at the big Canal Zone function down in Orlando. And I said, Dave, I don't play bass guitar. <laughs> and he encouraged me. Uh, he and Alex both actually encouraged me and said, no, you can do it. You have X number of months to bone up on it. Sure enough, we, uh, we played together at the function and it was a big honor for me to play with those guys. The reunion gigs were a lot of fun. Uh, they're fun because everyone knows us, we have fans. Well, Short and Slim's really about two things. Short and Slim's about friendship, and uh, I don't remember the second one. <laughs> memories. Oh yeah, memories. <laughs> about memories. Short and Slim, it's about memories, and strikingly enough, the, uh, the motto of our Canal Society is something about memories, isn't it? What is it? What goes on at the reunion stays at the reunion. That's what it is. It is. That's what it is. We have a good turnout at the party. Uh, everybody's dancing the whole time, and it's good to see old faces and old friends. It, it is the best. This is probably the greatest thing we'll ever do. Is to sit here full of a uh, room full of zonium. <laughs> if we can't make it through the song, uh, we need your help to help us. In case we start breaking down, huh? truly. But really, uh, people who are in the music business have their own ideas of of, uh, of success, and this is our success. I first was exposed to Shorty and Slim uh, when David and his family came over to my house. Uh, brought him over after church one day, and he had just moved to uh, our area there in the Netherlands and didn't have his guitars with him yet. So he saw mine and was like, hey, can I play? And I said, sure. And from that moment on, I was like, okay, <laughs> I just gotta learn everything I can from this guy because he is really good. And of course he shared uh, Shorty and Slim music with us and we became fans. I flew over to Holland for like two days. Dave set up a gig, uh, it was like a, a spring party and they wanted tropical music. So I flew over there, played with a band that we, Dave knew the guys and he had them kind of like kind of warmed up. I showed up. We did that gig on the fly. And we, we played a bunch of Shorty and Slim songs. It was just, it was so much fun to have Alex come over to the Netherlands and do that. That was a super gig. And then I flew out the next day. I got back to work. I was dead, boy. I was... And then a little bit later, um, I was home here in the summer to uh, Boise and uh, they flew me down to Florida to play a gig. So we played, it was the most fun I think I've ever had playing uh, with, with that band down there and the crowd was so good. I remember our first reunions, David and I would just bring our guitars and we'd play at the vendor table and meet people and sell CDs. We always had people ask, well, you know, can you come to our hospitality suite? We have a class of whatever reunion. So we would go and it was just us two and we thought, man, what are we gonna do here? We were looking for a percussionist and that's where we met Jaime Reber. And Jaime was a guy that, he was a friend of Roland's from the music scene back in the Canal Zone. And when he moved up to the States, he kept doing his Latin percussion with big name bands in Miami area. He, he accompanied us on the first couple hospitality suites that we just show up and do a couple songs. And that's where we found that Jaime was clave, a super addition to a shorty and slim vibe. And Jaime was such a happy guy, always ready to play. He would actually ask for set lists months in advance of a reunion to know what we were gonna do and then he'd study the, the albums and he would just nail it every time we would play. And those are the kind of things that logistically speaking, we needed a some kind of rhythm when we were gonna do Shorty and Slim and Jaime fit the bill perfectly. Pam 
Clark. Pam Clark, what a joy that was to do the next album with her. That was Rust, Termites, and Wega Vivos. We did 20 songs on an album. <laughs> I don't know what that was about. We probably broke all the rules there, putting so many songs on an album. But at Salt Mine Studio was really a really cozy experience because it was just the three of us and the band. And the songs, uh, we had already had them written when we went in. But that album right there kind of made a new a new sound for Shorty and Slim because that was the first time that we started doing uh, songs in Spanish and songs that were a little more Latino and Pam did a great job with mixing and, and mastering for us and that was when we realized you know we could do this we can continue doing this you know after after going down to Panama and after Russ Termites and Wega Vivos we realized we could do things separately the internet speed was fast enough that we could send samples back and forth we could even you know overdub things and send it back and forth so that the producer knew what we wanted and what the ideas were. 2010 was Rust, Termites, and Wega Vivos, and little did we know, but 10 years would pass until we produced our next album, Puente de Vida. And I don't know what happened in those 10 years, but we came around in 2019 and said, let's do it, let's get it. So we started, we produced that one with Luis Mafilos. I think the first time I remember having heard about Trinstam fue casualmente en el estudio Evan, eh, había un, creo que un disco de Chori en Stem tirado por ahí, recuerdo el nombre, me recuerdo que era super funny, me acuerdo que instantáneamente me sonó como Phil Collins cantando Calypso, no sé, ese era, ese era como, como el, el sonido del, de la voz de, de Alex. And we went to several studios to, to actually lay down tracks and, or program things, we went to uh, Rock and Folk Studio, we went to JCS PTY uh, with Juan Carlos Salmaniego, a few months ago, Alex said, um, hey Rick, do you want to play some harmonica in the new album that they're putting together? And so I, I said, yeah, I'd love to. And so we recorded some harmonica for the Boat Shed song. And we had a lot of fun uh, recording together. It's been a fantastic opportunity for me that I've never had in my life. So Luis Mafilos worked together with uh, Ignacio Humedes on that album. And that album has two little pieces because it's got like a programming side, program side. A little more of a beat side and I think 50% of the songs are in Spanish on that one and I was really really happy with that one and the, and the musicality of the whole thing. On this last album, Puente de Vida, uh, Catherine, my daughter, has done a lot of the background vocals. So I love hearing her on the album. Her voice really adds to it so I'm glad she got to be on this one. We did have to bounce around a little bit, and it took two years to make that one. That's the, I think that's the world record right there for Shorty and Slim on producing an album. We also have a lot of songs on the back burner that we could throw on another album. Making an album is a lot of work. It's a lot of fun, but we'll see how that goes. As a music partner and as a quote unquote business partner and a band member, Dave for me is kind of what keeps us on track, kind of keeps us within the margins of what we're trying to do. You know, he's the one who's always gonna be saying like, Alex, uh, you just booked three gigs on the same day. What are you gonna do? So he's always like the guy like checking me. I'm the one who gets all excited about stuff and says yes to everything and wants to do everything and let's go, let's go. And Dave's the one that's like, um, we only have two mics and you invited six singers. What are we gonna do? So he's like the yin and the yang of the group. Everybody's got a house in the old canal zone, huh? Well, I was gonna write a song about a house and I really didn't know how to do it and where to go about it. I had a house in my mind. It happened to be one in Gamboa, of course. But then I was on the internet and, well, I met Eric Petroni's sister, who's a, I shouldn't be using names, but Karina Petroni. And, uh, <laughs> Marina I was looking through her old pictures on her bio page on her website, and there's a picture of her crying when she was like 10 years old. And I was like, you know, I called, I wrote her email, and said, "What's that all about?" She says, "That's the day that I knew I had to leave my house because they were giving everything away." I was like, oh, man. <laughs> so this this came out of that. Mm. Keep talking. <laughs> there's a big house on high on what's still. It's what it ever is in town. The wood has turned like the screens are torn. Nothing looks like it's coming back. The first time I actually met and 
learned about Shorty and Slim was about uh, 10 years ago when I was working uh, in a documentary about Panama and US relations. And we wanted to interview, uh, interview Alex as an honest to God Sonian, and which we did. And he chose to be interviewed by the former entrance of the old ferry that used to cross the bay with the Puente de las Americas, AKA Thatcher Bridge as a background. Later on, when I got to know the band, I learned how they had this logo with the, the bridge of the Americas uh, as part of it. That shows how, uh, for me, how they uh, represent something that is really Panamanian and really unique as well. In uh, 1999, I moved down there to be a professor at uh, Florida State University in La Boca Balboa. And uh, I used to play my drums with my windows and the house open. And one day I was walking to the college and somebody stopped me and said, hey, I heard you playing congas. I got a band, uh, we're gonna be practicing this Friday night. Why don't you bring your, uh, your drums over and sit in with us? And uh, sure enough, I took my drums over there. I met Alex and uh, Roland and Omar and did that one practice with them and then for the next two years uh, I pretty much did weekly and monthly gigs uh, with Shorty and Slim. It was a very uh, special time uh, for me but also for the band. Uh, one of the most fascinating things at that moment for the band um, that, that I observed as an outsider especially in regards to the band and their role in, in, in the canal zone and the Zonian culture was that at that moment the canal zone was getting ready to switch hands um, and there was a certain feeling and sentiment that you know that a certain culture was going was going to be lost and there was a lot of memories and tradition uh, that was wrapped up in that culture and every time we played we just had uh, hordes of people come out and it was uh, what was really striking was the kind of the, the poetry and the music and how it captured kind of the essence of growing up in the old canal zone. And I felt that really deeply. It was something very special. And I saw the impact that it had on the people around us. There are many times I see their albums and I don't pick them up to listen to them because for me, there's as many as that bring joy there's many that also bring a lot of pain and sadness and anger of us losing our home. And when you feel down, when you miss home, when you miss the old days, you put some shorty and slim on. It's kind of like the oral history of the old canal zone. You hear some tunes, you hear some lyrics that remind you of what it was like to live in the canal zone and to love Panama. I feel very fortunate that I was there at that moment uh, in time. And it's wonderful today to see that uh, Shorty and Slim still goes on. Uh, that's been 20 years since then. I remember back in old canal zone was many things that made that place home. I remember the first time Alex actually came to me, and Alex might not remember this, but he came to me at the Corazal PX because Matt Tomlett and I were selling t-shirts called Kalan City t-shirts. And we had our own way of making an impact of memories on the canal zone through artwork that was put on shirts. And Alex came to me and he said, Eric, he goes, we've made this new album called Shorty and Slim Life on Mango Street. Would you help us get it into the PX? Do you have any connections? I said, yeah, sure. You gave us one of our first um, big hit designs and uh, yeah, so we, we have our roots together, me and, me and Shorty and Slim. Yes, a shirt's wonderful and a painting's wonderful, but with music, you can close your eyes and it pulls you back. There is nothing like music. I remember the day I first saw Shorty and Slim perform. It was at the old officers club up in Albrook, which was then uh, recently handed over to the Shriners. They had a function out the back and Shorty and Slim were the artists that were asked to perform. Never heard of them before. I hadn't been there here that long, I suppose. And uh, I was taken aback. I laughed. 
I was amused. Everybody got up and did a little bit of jumping around. And that was my first introduction to short hinge then. Why so great? It's simple, really, because they just tell it as it is. They make a joke of it, but we can relate to it because it, it's so real. It's what actually happens. Y, y, y eso es lo que caracteriza a, a, a la música de Chori. La música de Chori es, es suena a Panamá, es, es Panamá, es, es la idiosincrasia de, de el, que solo podría haberse desarrollado en, 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 en este país. Es una mezcla de, de todo un poco. Tiene desde de Calypso hasta rock, pasando por pop y reggae y reggaetón. I would say that uh, Shorty and Slim are as relevant to Panamanian music and culture as Ruben Blades or uh, Los Rabanes even. Uh, they talk about not only Sonian culture but also things related to all Panamanians. Dave and Alex are storytellers natos and they write in the way en la que te van llevando por, por, por un cuento y te crean un mundo y, y te pintan una, una, un cuadro, es como, como, como una buena película, tiene todo un poco, tiene romance, acción, comedia. Uh, their shows are like for three hours and those types of musicians are, are very unique. Their music is really like no other in, in representing things that are really our own. Yeah, short and slim are great. They're the best kept secret in Panamanian music. Shorty white. That came out pretty good, I think. What do you think? Oh, 25 years of shorty and slim. What's next? What's next? I'm gonna get that bird. Come on, guy. Give me a break over here. Having shorty and and Myra in Alabama now is really nice because it's the first time we've been on the same time zone in 20 years since they left in '99. So it's easy to pick up the phone and new ideas are bouncing around all the time. Things are looking really good for Shorty and Slim uh, as we as we move into our twilight years. <laughs> We're still writing some new music. People all around the world are looking for positive music, and Shorty and Slim wants to bring that to them in our way and in our, and the energy that we have. So look look out for Shorty and Slim. 25 years is just the beginning. Tonight I'll raise a toast to all of my friends, to our lives, no regrets, the only one that we get, so short, so long, our lives.